This is when Gen X ruled the multiplex, in which I look at the films that shaped the minds of those of us who were born between 1965 and 1980. Wes Craven got his start as a hardcore porn director, before segueing into horror in the 1970s with The Last House on the Left and The Hills Have Eyes. 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street, which Craven wrote and directed, was made for under $2 million and quickly became a big success, launching a long-running franchise and becoming one of the best-known examples of a particularly robust 80s film subgenre. Slasher films. A nightgown wearing teenager named Tina runs through a creepy dark boiler room. She's pursued by a man wearing a fedora and a striped sweater and wielding a glove with the fingers tipped with sharp knives. The man grabs Tina and tries to stab her, but it turns out to be all a dream. Tina wakes up in her own bed, but the front of her nightgown is mysteriously ripped as though it's been slashed by knives. Tina is played by Amanda Weiss, whom we have seen playing Brad's girlfriend in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Tina tells her best friend Nancy and Nancy's boyfriend Glenn all about her nightmare. Nancy admits she's been having nightmares, too. Nancy is played by Heather Langenkamp in her first major role. She was cast while she was a freshman at Stanford. In the 80s, Langenkamp was best known for this role and for Just the Ten of Us, a Growing Pains spin-off that aired for three seasons on ABC. Glenn is played by Johnny Depp in his screen debut. Depp would then star in the Fox series 21 Jump Street, which raised him to major heartthrob status before becoming a very bankable movie star. For the most part, I feel absolutely no shame about the pop culture I love or have loved, but I do feel a twinge of embarrassment to confess that for a moment in 1987, my favorite TV show was 21 Jump Street. Glenn and Nancy spend the night at Tina's while Tina's mom is out of town. While discussing their nightmares, Nancy and Tina realize they dreamed about the same man with the knife-tipped glove. Tina's bad boy boyfriend Rod drops by for some sexy shenanigans. Rod is played by Nick Corey, who now goes by Jesu Garcia, who always seemed on the cusp of a big breakthrough in the 80s. Along with A Nightmare on Elm Street, he is known for the terrible spy thriller Gotcha, and for memorable guest appearances on a pair of Miami Vice episodes. Post-coital, Rod confesses to Tina he's been having nightmares too. In the middle of the night, Tina wanders outside and is attacked by the man with the knife-tipped glove. She sees him clearly for the first time and realizes his visible flesh is covered with horrific burns. It turns out Tina is having a nightmare. She screams in her sleep, and as Rod watches in horror, she's dragged up to the bedroom ceiling by an unseen supernatural force and is slashed to death. Nancy and Glenn burst into the bedroom to find Tina dead and Rod gone, having fled through the window. At the police station, Nancy's father, the local police lieutenant, grills his daughter about Tina's murder. Nancy's mother is at the station as well though Nancy's parents are estranged from each other. Nancy's father is played by John Saxon, known for many films, including Enter the Dragon. Her mother is played by Ronnie Blakely, best known for her Oscar-nominated performance in Robert Altman's Nashville. Nancy's father assumes Rod murdered Tina, though Nancy refuses to believe it. A fugitive Rod confronts Nancy and pleads his innocence, but he's ambushed and arrested by Nancy's father. At school, Nancy falls asleep in class and dreams about seeing Tina's corpse dragged down the hallway. In her dream, she wanders through the school and winds up in the boiler room, where she's taunted by the man with the knife-tipped fingers. Aware she's stuck in a nightmare, Nancy deliberately burns her arm on the boiler. She wakes up in class, screaming and hysterical, and is reassured by her teacher. Nancy's teacher is played by Lynn Shea, who would later be dubbed the godmother of horror for her role in the Insidious horror franchise. Even though Nancy is now fully awake, the burn she received in her dream is present in the real world. Nancy visits Rod in jail. He tells her he's been having nightmares about the burned man as well. At home, Nancy falls asleep in the bathtub and has a nightmare in which the burned man drags her underwater and tries to drown her. Nancy screams for help, and her mother bursts in and wakes her from her nightmare. Afraid to sleep, Nancy takes caffeine pills and stays up all night watching Sam Raimi's horror classic The Evil Dead. Glenn climbs in through her bedroom window. She tells him she's going to try to deliberately confront the burned man in her dream, but she needs Glenn to wake her up before the man can kill her. Nancy goes to sleep and dreams of walking to the police station, where she witnesses the burned man menacing a sleeping rod in his jail cell. The burned man spots Nancy and chases her. Glenn, who is super cute but utterly worthless, has fallen asleep and thus fails to wake her up. The burned man attacks Nancy, but her alarm clock does what Glenn failed to do and brings her out of her nightmare before the man can kill her. Glenn and Nancy race to the police station to tell Nancy's father that Rod is in mortal danger. Before they can reach the holding cell, the burned man strangles Rod to death with his bedsheets. Concerned about Nancy's nightmares, her mother takes her to a clinic for sleep disorders, where Dr. King will monitor her brainwaves for strange activity. Dr. King is played by Charles Fleischer, best known as the voice of Roger Rabbit. Nancy's nurse is played by Wes Craven's then-wife, Mimi Craven. While under Dr. King's supervision, Nancy falls asleep and has another nightmare. Dr. King and her mother wake her up and find that her arm has been slashed with knives. In her dream, Nancy grabbed the burned man's fedora. Since she was holding it when she woke up, she was able to take it with her from the dream realm into the real world. The man's name is written inside the fedora. 
Fred Krueger. Fred Krueger, or Freddy Krueger as he is much more commonly known, is played by Robert England. At the time, England was best known for playing an alien on ABC's popular miniseries and TV show V, and whom we saw briefly in Never Too Young to Die. Determined to defeat Freddy Krueger before he can murder her, Nancy refuses to go to sleep and she reads up on how to set booby traps. Concerned about her daughter's mental health, Nancy's mother installs bars on all the windows and doors in their home to trap Nancy inside, which seems like a weird thing for her to do. She then invites Nancy down to the cellar for a serious talk. Apparently, Freddy Krueger murdered 20 kids in the neighborhood in the not-too-distant past, but his case was thrown out of court. So a band of enraged parents, Nancy's parents included, tracked him down to an abandoned boiler room and set him on fire, killing him. Nancy calls Glenn to explain that she's going to drag Freddy out of the dream realm so she can capture him in the real world. Her plan hinges upon having Glenn wake her up promptly at midnight, which will be exactly the moment she grabs hold of Freddy. Glenn, who is looking especially fetching in a half shirt, agrees to Nancy's plan, then falls asleep, because Glenn is useless. Fortunately, his mom wakes him up. Unfortunately, Glenn promptly falls back asleep, and his father takes the phone off the hook so Nancy can't call and wake him. Nancy tries to go to Glenn's house to wake up her idiot boyfriend, but she finds her mother has barricaded her inside the house, because every single adult in this film is awful. So Freddy murders half-shirt-wearing Glenn by sucking him into his bed and turning him into a ridiculously excessive geyser of blood. When Nancy's dad arrives to investigate Glenn's murder, Nancy calls him to tell him she can catch Glenn's killer, just as long as her dad wakes her up in exactly 20 minutes. Nancy's dad agrees to do this, then promptly ignores the request, because no one in this film ever listens to Nancy. Nancy, who fortunately is quite capable of getting the job done on her own, channels her inner Kevin McAllister by rigging the house with semi-lethal traps, including tripwire light bulbs filled with gunpowder, and sledgehammers positioned to drop down from the ceiling. With all that in place, she goes to sleep. Nancy dreams of being chased by Freddy. Because she's too savvy to rely on her dad to wake her in time, she has also set an alarm clock, which yanks her out of her nightmare exactly at midnight, right when she grabs hold of Freddy. Trapped in the real world with Nancy, Freddy chases her all around the house and triggers all her booby traps. Nancy douses him in kerosene and sets him on fire, then leaves him locked in the cellar while she shouts through the barred front door for her dad to save her. Her dad breaks into the house, but in the meantime, Freddy escapes from the cellar and heads upstairs, where he burns Nancy's mother to death and sucks her into the bed. Freddy then attacks Nancy, but she decides the best way to deal with him is to show no fear. In the face of her bravery, Freddy loses all his power, and he shrivels up and dissolves away into nothingness. Nancy steps outside into a suspiciously bright and beautiful day. Her mother is magically still alive, as are Tina, Glenn, and Rod, who zip up in Glenn's convertible. As soon as Nancy is inside the car, though, the convertible traps them all and drives off, while Freddy attacks Nancy's mother through the door. If you're thinking to yourself that the ending makes very little sense, you are correct. A Nightmare on Elm Street starts off as a lean, mean, well-plotted machine, and then it kind of falls to pieces in the third act. But that's okay, there's so much this film handles well that I'm willing to forgive a little carelessness in the final stretch. The film was followed by multiple sequels throughout the 80s and 90s. Freddy's Revenge, Dream Warriors, The Dream Master, The Dream Child, Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, and Wes Craven's New Nightmare. In 2003, we had Freddy vs. Jason, in which Freddy goes head-to-head -head with the indestructible killer from the Friday the 13th franchise. Then in 2010, the franchise was rebooted from scratch with a remake of this first film with an entirely new cast. While some characters like Nancy occasionally appear throughout the franchise, Freddy is the only constant in each film. We are approaching 40 years of having Freddy Krueger in our lives, and that's because audiences were wildly entertained by this character from his first introduction. Mind you, Freddy has changed a lot over the decades. In this first film, he doesn't have that many lines, and while he clearly has a sardonic personality, he doesn't tell many outright jokes. In the later films, Freddy becomes famous for cracking one-liners, and the films themselves become more self-referential and knowingly comedic. Here, though, Freddy is a sadistic, murderous apparition who also happens to have a distinct personality instead of just being a faceless monster, and viewers found that very refreshing. In the 70s and 80s, slasher films like this — they're also known as dead teenager films for obvious reasons — became very popular with both audiences and studios. Horror films, and particularly slasher films, generally don't get much critical respect, because they're sensationalistic almost by definition. That's a feature, not a flaw. One of the primary goals of horror films is to provoke a strong and immediate emotional response in viewers through images that are creepy, or gory, or violent, or lurid. Because of this, horror films are often regarded as intellectually inferior to films with fewer sensationalistic elements, 
even though many horror films are extraordinarily well made, with complex characters and sophisticated themes. Despite this critical disdain, Hollywood studios are largely kept afloat by horror films, because they're relatively simple and inexpensive to make, and they tend to turn a profit. And A Nightmare on Elm Street, while not a great film, is a solid, solid example of the horror genre. Apart from all being ridiculously attractive, the four young stars at its core all give good performances, playing well-written and well-developed characters. Heather Langenkamp's Nancy, in particular, is a great proactive character, who figures out how to beat Freddy at his own game and executes a solid plan to trap him. Wes Craven got the basic idea for the story from news reports on a smattering of cases of sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome in otherwise healthy young adult male refugees from Southeast Asia, who would die unexpectedly following nightmares, probably due to a combination of stress and genetics. It's an effective hook for a horror film. A Nightmare on Elm Street is not an especially scary film, but it is visually memorable. By having most of Freddy's attacks take place inside dreams, the film gets to bend physical laws and embrace surreality during the action sequences. In A Nightmare on Elm Street, the parents took justice into their own hands by killing Freddy, and their children are paying a high price for their actions. And the parents in this film are utterly useless. While they mean well, they don't listen to their kids, and thus they hinder far more than they help. That feeling is probably familiar to a lot of Gen Xers from our teen years. Adults are messing us up because they're hiding information from us and they're not listening to us. By tapping into those feelings of teen alienation and frustration, A Nightmare on Elm Street earned the allegiance of young Gen X viewers who felt a sense of kinship with its doomed young protagonists. Next time, Bruce Leroy takes on the Shogun of Harlem in the cult classic The Last Dragon. Thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you then.